Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it a moment for people to get logged in and we'll get started in just about a minute. Okay, we have a pretty good crowd in and the logins are slowing down. So I think it's a good time to start. I'm Katie Donovan. Thank you for joining us for the ASPPH Public Health Career Spotlights, Hospitals and Population Health. Um, this is being held by the Career Services Assemblies. I think that's what we're called. And we hope to be having more of these. For today, we're going to be talking specifically on public health professionals in hospital and healthcare systems. If you do have questions, and we do definitely want to have a period of time that we'll be answering your questions at the end, please ask them by writing in the Q&A portion of the your Zoom screen at the bottom, and we will look at all of those at the probably last 15 minutes or so. Also, let's see, I think we can move to the next slide. Thanks. Um, sorry, you can't see me. Technical difficulties today, but our friends at ASPPH are doing an amazing job keeping this running. So thank you, Nick. I'm Katie Donovan, the Director of Career Services at Tufts University School of Medicine. And that's where we house our public health, our master's in public health programs. I'm going to be joined by a great panel of three people momentarily, but before we ask them to introduce themselves, I'm gonna talk a little about the careers in public health. And so think of this slide as a, a Cheat sheet, should you go to a job board? Should you go looking on LinkedIn? Who do I wanna network? Because I wanna get a public health job within hospitals. And in hospitals, they really typically use the language population health with, uh, that people within public health degrees or education can get. Um, they also use public health, don't get me wrong, but you'll see population health kind of as a new language to use there for you. This slide really gives you the column on the right-hand side, the yellow column. is kind of like the end, end part of a job. So depending on if you're getting an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree, you may start as an assistant, you may graduate into a director level. Think of the assistant and coordinator jobs as typically supportive roles, uh, they may be a good starting off point for an undergraduate degree with little or no job experience. Coordinator though also can be one of those weird titles that actually secretly means manager. So you do wanna make sure you read the job description before applying and make sure it aligns with you. Specialist and analyst tends to be individual contributor jobs, which would be a perfect fit for undergrads and graduate level, depending on your experience. And then manager and director or anything higher, typically will be a graduate degree with experience or BAs or undergraduate degrees. You, you get into those levels a few years down the road, you're not gonna graduate right into them more often than not. But you can take any of the other uh, words or titles on that screen, the two left-hand columns and just add those those end names. So policy manager, department specialist, program coordinator. Those are how you kind of think of how this slide can help you do a little sleuthing on the types of jobs within a hospital and healthcare systems that a person with a public health degree could get. My friendly hint on this is, should you be doing some networking I would also make sure, regardless of what job level you want, you go to manager or director level to, to make sure you are talking to people who can actually hire you as well. You talk to the people who are doing the jobs you're interested in, but also the people who are doing the jobs that can hire you. 
and my little friendly story about why public health professionals are in hospital systems. Way back when, when I first got my first job in public health, I used to work on policy stuff. A friend of mine who had a master's in business administration, an MBA, she has at this point worked in two different hospital systems. And she was saying that, you know, people with public health degrees are always treated so much better than us business degree people. I don't know why that is, and it really kind of bugs me. And it makes sense because, you know, the people with public health degrees get the chance to see a little more of the healthcare part of it and, and be more on the inside of what the clinicians are thinking, where business people tend to be thought of as the numbers crunchers, <laughs> you know, so it makes sense. It's a little bit why, but we'll hear from the people who actually are working in hospital systems with public health degrees tell us if my friend's story is actually real or she just is feeling very neglected one day at work. Um, and with that, if we can go back to our panelists and ask Nimra to be the first one to introduce herself. Um, certainly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this webinar. I'm so excited to see all of the aspiring hospital professionals. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to ASPPH and to Katie and Nick specifically for organizing this webinar. I'm really excited to be a panelist here. Um, so to begin, to introduce myself, um, my name is Nimra Salim, and I am currently the lead business operations coordinator for the section of geriatrics and palliative medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I hold bachelor's degrees in public health and Spanish from the University of Texas at Austin. I graduated in 2017, and after that time, I came to Houston and I got my first job in research as a coordinator at Baylor. Um, I pursued my MPH from the University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston, and my concentration was in healthcare management. I just graduated with that degree last year in 2021, and after that, I transitioned to an administrative role at Baylor, and I've been here for about seven or eight months. Um, so a little bit about my job is um, I, as the administrator for palliative medicine, I am mainly working with the inpatient palliative team at our hospital, which is Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston. Um, I mainly am helping to navigate the different challenges that the palliative team faces on a daily basis. Um, I, I think that it's important to note that Palliative medicine is one field of medicine that is often misconstrued as just being hospice and end of life care. During my short time here in palliative medicine, I've come to realize that it really kind of spans beyond just that definition. It's about comfort care. It's about having those difficult conversations with patients who have really complex diseases. And it definitely is a very pressing issue in population health, which is why I think having my MPH has been really beneficial in this role. Um, I deal with day-to-day -day operations in geriatrics and palliative medicine, working on billing reports, making sure that my faculty members are meeting their target, getting their RVUs in, um, making sure that our internal medicine residents are getting the full breadth of their learning experience. Um, there's also the educational component of it at, at Baylor, um, as it's an academic medical center. And um, I do um, a lot of work with strategic operations and just working with palliative care expansion and how we can better communicate with other pavilions throughout the Texas Medical Center and within our hospital systems to just improve our approach and our reach within the hospital systems. Um, I am an early careerist for sure. So although I'm not directly involved in hiring at Baylor, I can definitely offer a lot of insight as to how you can get that first administrative role after you complete your public health degree. I think the best piece of guidance I can give anyone is that, you know, if you have an MPH, you should really market your skills as an administrator and really be able to speak to those qualities that you can offer in an administrative role, such as knowing how to work with the financials, knowing how to work with billing and strategic operations. Um, 
I think really just making those skills very obvious and very prominent on your resume and in your cover letters will really benefit you a lot when you're applying for jobs. And of course, as Katie stated before, like networking with people that are in the director roles, networking with people that have the jobs that you want to have, um, that's really valuable because it kind of gives you that insight in understanding how you can also find your pathway in administration. Um, I'm really happy to help offer any kind of guidance for early careers. And, um, you know, I, I think that, for example, at Baylor, one job title that would be uh, really suitable for someone who's a recent graduate would be a business operations coordinator role. Um, that gives you a lot of insight as to the different aspects of healthcare administration that you can potentially pivot into. And it, it gives you a chance to really be involved in a hospital system and understand the operations and the logistics of the faculty members and how we, we work with the different physicians and the different pavilions in, in a hospital system. So I'm really excited to be here and I'm so excited to get to know our other panelists here as well. Thank you, Nimra. And Madison, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, like Nimra, I'm very excited to be here and uh, very appreciative of the folks who helped organize this whole event. And I know this would have been very helpful for me um, as someone you know who recently did graduate with their MPH degree as well. So um, yeah, just to introduce myself, my name is Madison Walker. I am a research project manager at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I have a master's in public health degree um, with a concentration in health behavior, and I received that from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I completed my undergraduate degree at Indiana University uh, studying psychology and neuroscience. And prior to pursuing a master's degree, I worked at a community behavioral health center um, doing program evaluation work. So the research project um, that I work on at Brigham and Women's Hospital is called All of Us. All of Us is funded by the NIH. It's a landmark precision medicine initiative. So precision medicine as a field really focuses on customized or individualized healthcare. So medical decisions and treatments are really tailored to individuals instead of using a one size fits all kind of approach to medicine. Um, so the All of Us research study is recruiting 1 million people across the United States um, that really reflect the diversity of the United States. Um, and we're collecting their biospecimens such as saliva, urine, and blood, and all other kinds of health data to really create this large database for researchers and doctors to have access to, to answer all kinds of hypothesis-driven research questions. Um, and this is really big because when you work in research, so much of your time really is taken up by recruiting participants and collecting data and um, retaining participants over time if it's a longitudinal study. Um, so this is really a way for us to kind of lay some groundwork and hope to speed up research by kind of allowing researchers to kind of skip over those initial stages of the research process. Um, so that's kind of just a really broad overview of the specific project that I work on. Um, but in terms of my day-to-day -day responsibilities, I manage a team of research assistants. Um, they're also called research enrollment coordinators. For us, those terms are interchangeable. Um, I have a team of 10 RAs, so I provide oversight and assistance to them as needed. You know, I manage their timesheets, um, our workflows. I provide biweekly supervision to each of them individually. Um, but other tasks that I do include overseeing various data needs that we have. So really understanding all of the systems that we collect data in, um, doing data cleaning and wrangling, producing tables, figures, you know, running quick descriptive stats um, kind of things. And then a really big thing for us too is, is overall progress monitoring. So working with our various dashboards and reports, um, to ensure that we're meeting our agreed upon milestones and targets. And since we are funded by the NIH, I mean, there are quite a few, um, you know, reports and things that we have to complete and make sure that we're, we're meeting um, by certain time points. And then uh, another thing that I think is kind of fun that I get to do is, is some creative thinking around our recruitment processes um, and think about ways that we can improve those within the hospital. Since we're trying to recruit 1 million folks across the United States, um, Brigham and Women's is obviously not our only recruitment site, um, it, but we really do wanna think about ways that we can recruit all across the hospital from staff to patients um, to just anyone kind of visiting the hospital. 
And so another big thing for me is also relationship building around the hospital, really spreading the word of our program, getting permission to recruit on certain floors around the hospital, um, ensuring we have a good working relationship between our staff and the, the team that runs the clinical spaces where we have to do all of our data collection and things like that. Um, as a manager, I'm also involved in a lot of sort of like, you know, the big communications that come from the NIH and trickle down to us. I have to make sure that not only are my RAs aware of all of these, you know, changes or updates to the program, but also that they know how to implement this information into their daily workflows and kind of what it means for them on the ground and how it affects um, our processes. Um, I am involved in hiring for our team. Um, so we have another manager who tends to do all of the screening calls with folks. So she'll, you know, review resumes and um, reach out to people that, you know, she wants to do a quick, maybe 10, 15 minute phone call with just to touch base and kind of ask some more generic questions. But then she will um, pass folks on to the other managers at our various sites that she thinks candidates might be interested in. So um, I'm involved in the process of interviewing and then, um, you know, going forward with reference checks and things like that. Um, and I'm also the manager for our training team. So whenever we have new folks join our team, um, I work with our, our wonderful team to really onboard all of our new staff and ensure a smooth transition. Um, but yeah, that's a really brief overview of kind of my day to day and a little bit about my backgrounds. But again, I'm super happy to be here. Thanks so much, Madison. And finally, Mary, would you do the honor of introducing yourself? All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Song. Hello from Palo Alto, California. Um, I am very thankful to be part of this panel. I um, had graduated from my uh, master's in public health um, 17 years ago and really wish there was a webinar like this to help prepare me for working in a hospital setting, which I knew very early on I wanted to do. Um, and it, it was quite a bit of a journey for me to get there. So I'm happy to share um, that journey today. Um, I graduated from Tufts University undergrad uh, with a degree, dual degree in biopsychology and community health. Um, and then graduated from Tufts School of Medicine with my master's in public health. Um, one of my for earlier jobs, um, actually while I was in grad school was a research assistant. Um, and I really appreciate the skill sets that I, I received, especially um, coming out of school. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to be closer to patient care. There was just something very exciting about being in the hospital, being in the exam rooms where patients were, were getting care from these amazing clinicians, um, you know, at top of their field. And I knew I wanted to be part of that environment. But I didn't know how to get there. How do you get your foot in the door in, in a healthcare delivery setting? And so for me, that was applying for um, administrative fellowships. I was very fortunate um, through the American College of Healthcare Executives, and I'll include a link in the chat. Um, there were pro fellowship programs that were one year long that allowed you to do rotations in um, different hospital settings. And usually they're one year long, you apply for it, you interview with other candidates. And I did mine at Cambridge Health Alliance in Massachusetts. Um, and that was an incredible learning opportunity where I got to rotate across quality, nursing, ambulatory, inpatient care. Um, and at the end of my year of fellowship, I was so thrilled to be able to have a job as a quality specialist um, at Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, from there, I did end up moving to California. I got married, moved across the country, and I was able to use that job as a quality specialist to then get a quality uh, manager job at Stanford Healthcare. Um, and that is the organization I've been at the last 14 years. Um, but even in quality, you know, I noticed that there were a lot of nurses who were in my role. Um, so I, I found that there was a department called Performance Improvement who also does process improvement. There are a lot of consultants that came in and I actually wanna put a plug in for that department because I think that is a great department to apply for jobs, especially in transitioning a public health degree. You know, you're looking at problem solving, brainstorming solutions, defining an issue and how do you improve patient care with engaging the right stakeholders. Um, and we, we did hire a lot of MPHs in that department. Um, who are specialists and then consultants and then ended up going into operations, which is actually what I did. Um, I uh, have been the manager for our outpatient palliative medicine clinic for the last two years. Um, I oversee a team of um, 
nurse practitioners, social workers, chaplains, medical assistants um, who take care of patients every day. Um, so initially, I didn't think that I was meant for operations. I thought it would just be, you know, trying to figure out how to, you know, deal with personnel issues or, you know, put out fires. But there's such a a wealth of knowledge that I gained from my public health degree in terms of looking at system level changes and providing holistic care, which is why I love palliative medicine, um, and trying to figure out how you can just improve patient care day by day as a system and not just one patient at a time. Um, and so I've been um, uh, in that role for, for the last couple of years. And so rewarding things that I have found in that role is you know rolling out video visits during the pandemic for our patients doing strategy planning. So we make sure we have the service of palliative medicine in um, demographics that might not have something for um, patients, you know, in between their oncology care and say hospice. Um, and um, I have loved every bit of it. Um, I um, wanna also emphasize that what Nimmer was saying in terms of focusing on the skill set, because as a hiring manager, I don't just look at, you know, did you come from another hospital system? If you came from a research facility or a public health agency, um, as long as the skill sets match what is in the job description for the role, that is more important to me. So I would say use your cover letters, um, definitely highlight those skill sets in your resume. I, I find it very surprising where um, the candidates put it on the manager to, to do that, translate it for them, especially if you're coming from a different setting into hospitals, because that'll make a huge difference. All right, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mary, I appreciate that. And really all three of you, thank you for being here and giving us your time and your insights. I'm gonna start with some questions. We actually have a bunch of questions already in q and I'm gonna start with a couple that I have and then we'll probably jump into those pretty quickly. Nimra, if you could start us and please Mary and Madison feel free to jump in as well. Can you talk about that transition from whether you had a job while you were in school or undergrad or graduate school and then transitioning to that first post-graduation job? What were the surprises that you discovered in the process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, um, when I was pursuing my master's, I was working as a clinical research coordinator with the Department of Gastroenterology at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and my job mainly consisted of managing clinical trials, recruitment of patients, adhering to research protocols. And later on, as I approached my degree, I started to really learn more about budgets and just navigating the, navigating the budgets with our research sponsors and the different providers. So I think um, one surprise that for me that I would really like to reiterate is just how many of the skills I developed that actually were transferable to an administrative role that might not have been obvious. Um, and so I think that the best piece of advice I can give when you're transitioning from your, your job that you have in school to a job that you might look for after you graduate is that, you know, really just look at look at the skills within your job and see how those can transfer over to an administrative role. And you'd be surprised that it, it may not be an obvious transition, but you can learn a lot from whatever job you have within a hospital system or within a healthcare system. Um, I learned about the first budgets I learned about were actually research budgets, but that information still translated over to the budgets that I navigate now, which are more of like operations budgets with the palliative medicine team. Um, I also think it's really important to just network within your own organization. If you're interested in administration, don't be afraid to talk to your administrator and tell them, look, this is the path I want to take. Can we talk for a few minutes about how I can learn more and what are the opportunities that I can benefit from? Um, Mary also mentioned the American College of Healthcare Executives, which was a great help to me, both as a student and as a recent grad. Um, so that's been, um, I, I'm also going to plug that organization because they were so helpful in just getting me connected to different opportunities. And I think when you're transitioning out of school into the workforce, they can be so helpful in just navigating that whole process and talking to people that can support you in, in your goals and in your path. Great. Um, Madison or Mary, anything to add on to that? Or should we move to the next question?
I will move on. Madison, I'm going to go to you for the next question, at least to start it. And Mary did a little um, touching on this already about candidates and what stood out when she's hiring. Madison, can you talk to what you look for um, for the winning candidate? What makes them stand out from the competition when you're deciding yeah. who to hire? Yeah, so for me personally, I, I mean, I love to see the skills. And like Mary was saying, please do highlight those in your cover letter and make it as clear as possible. Um, cover letters are really important. I know they're kind of time consuming to write, but I do think a good cover letter will go so far. Um, but when I'm actually interviewing someone, something that's so important to me is that they're, they have um, a passion for the work that we're doing, that they're aligned with our program's mission. Um, especially in fields like public health where, you know, it's hard work and especially working in a hospital and, you know, just you see a lot of tough things sometimes and it can be draining. And I think, you know, finding folks that are really passionate and want to do the work that you're doing can make all the difference. And, and for me, that's can sometimes be more important actually than do you have every single skill that I'm looking for um, because we can train and we do train on all of those things. Um, so that's really important. And then the other big thing, I think just when you're doing an interview is being a clear communicator. Um, I, as a person who does a lot of interviews with folks, I try to send a few sample questions ahead of time, not to give my candidates like extra tasks to do or anything, but I really like people to have some time to reflect. And I think, you know, I know not everyone sends questions ahead of time, but really just trying to think like, what will I be asked in this interview? And how can I, you know, describe my work history, my interests, my education background in a concise way, but still being very clear and kind of hitting those main points that that the managers is gonna wanna hear. Um, so yeah, I would say those are kind of the top things that I personally look for. And then also someone just being responsive. Um, you know, I think thank you emails are always nice. They never hurt. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, just following up in a, an appropriate time um, is really great. Can you define appropriate time for follow-up? Because I think everyone has a completely different definition. They do. On that. <laughs> and I think that's such an interesting question because like from a personal standpoint, I really hate, um, you know, the idea we all have to be so uh, attached to our email at all times. I don't think people need to respond to me immediately. I do not think I'm that important. And I don't like when people have that expectation. Um, but, you know, when you are looking for a job, if, if I reach out to someone and I'm, I'm like, you know, I would love to interview you. Can we set up a time? I'd love to hear back within 24 hours. Um, for us too, a lot of it is because we try to have a quick hiring process, both for the candidate's benefit and for our benefit. We like to bring people on. We also don't want you waiting for three months before you find out if you got the job. Um, so, so I would say, you know, 24 to 48 hours would be really good to at least communicate something. Um, and of course, I'm sure there's exceptions to all that, but yeah, I like, and then if you're sending a thank you email, you know, within within a day, just to follow up. And, and it, it's it's nice to also hear sometimes some of the things that they appreciated about our conversation and, and even extra thoughts that they had after the interview. It shows me they were thinking about it, you know, after we stopped talking um, and shows that they're really, you know, interested in the role. Great. I think your timing, it, it, it fits my definition, if nothing else. So I like that. Mary, do you by chance have anything to add from what you previously said about hiring and what Madison just shared? Yeah, I think um, I definitely want to um, emphasize what Madison also mentioned about passion. Um, if two candidates were, one had more experience and the other had less, but had more passion, I would select the candidate with more passion. Um, because in the end, end of the day, retention is important and we want to invest in individuals who is going to stay with our team. Um, something that I have seen in interviews is how people respond to the question, where do you see yourself in three years, five years? And I know a lot of people applying, they're aspiring to, um, to grow and to professionally develop. But remember that um, we are hiring for someone who we think will be staying in our team, right? And there's definitely progression and growth in that department. Um, and so when we hear things like, oh, well, I hope to kind of go, go back to, you know, apply to a PhD program, or like I would then like to transition to a different department, those are red flags <laughs> for managers. So just something to keep in mind as you're kind of shaping your story and thinking about, I mean, I think you should be true to yourself. 
um, but also kind of think from the lens of a hiring manager, how you can show that you are someone who is fit for the team for the, for the long run as well. Um, and I, the thing I also would want to note is I spent probably um, the first 10 years working in hospitals focused on getting experience across different departments. My goal was not to move up. So even though there is a nice progression from analyst to specialist to manager, um, I felt like that gave me much more experience that actually gave me what um, the skill sets that I needed to be in operations today, which I really feel is is my dream job in, in healthcare, but it took me a while to get there. And it wasn't, I didn't get it off the bat. Um, and I needed to figure out that operations was for me. So don't, don't be afraid to, to do that, to move um, kind of in a parallel role in another department, because a lot of academic medical centers are huge, right? They have many departments that have administrative um, roles. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So I have a definition question for you now. <laughs> Little did I know I'd be doing this. Passion. I think every single student who comes to career services has in their cover letter, I have a passion for, and then it, there's no actual passion coming through. So tell me how, and anyone jump into this conversation, how do you actually want to hear about their passion? Because I'm guessing a sentence I have a passion for is not what you're really looking for. Um, I can start with that real quick and, and hand off to Madison. For, for me, um, I need to hear um, some, some action, right? So um, what did you do to get you to um, wanting to apply for this role? Like, did you do any research online on what palliative medicine is or what the department is or what the role is? Um, how are you doing any volunteering, community service? Like, how are you building your, your interest, right? And there needs to be con congruity in, in the story. So you're right, saying passion and we see that in the cover letter. We need examples of that um, and how they've built themselves um, to be fit to apply for that position. Um, but Madison, number what, what else did you want to add? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that, Mary. I think one thing that comes to mind too, that's maybe just like a quick tip is when you're writing your cover letter, be more detailed about it. Um, I think so many terms in public health are very broad. Public health as a term itself is very broad. Um, so if you tell me you're passionate about public health, uh, okay, great. I figure you are because you have a public health degree and, and that's amazing, but I would love more. Like what specifically gets you excited? And what about my the research program that you're applying for, for, for me, for example, as someone who works in research, what about our program excites you and and how do you think this is going to like benefit you in the long run like I really care about the candidates that are coming to me like what their professional development will look like as well um, and it's a little interesting um, because Mary was mentioning you know like you don't necessarily want someone coming to you and saying that they're hoping to go back to grad school in a year or two which I think for the most part is absolutely true for my team that's true except for for our research assistant roles for those folks we expect them to be going to grad school within a few years and i think it's a really unique opportunity for people that want more experience but know they're going to go to grad school or maybe go to a, a different grad program or whatever it may be within a few years because it it's kind of expected um so but yeah back to the the passion question i think just being more specific and showing that you've put the thought in um, to what you're applying for. And again, I think conveying it in a cover letter as best as you can, but then in your interview, I think you can do so much more as well. Of course, that's assuming you get the interview and I realize there's so many things that go into that, but Nemra, do you wanna add? <laughs> uh, for sure. I think also just from my early career's point of view, I've always felt that I'm very passionate about healthcare. And I think for me, the, what goes into that is just, wanting to take on as many learning opportunities and just chances to be more involved in in my position within Baylor and within the medical center even if I would not gain anything from it immediately it was about so much more than a paycheck I mean I'm not going to lie being a research coordinator you know my paycheck was not great I didn't do things just for the money I I did it because I genuinely had the passion for learning more about healthcare and getting involved in opportunities um I really saw myself within a hospital setting. And I think that just the energy of it was something that I would try to convey a lot on my resume. Um, and, you know, just taking opportunities to learn as much as you possibly can about your field. I didn't know a lot about palliative medicine when I came in, to be honest, I still have so much I need to learn, but I, I take the opportunity to read up as much as I can, listen to podcasts, talk to as many professionals 
I, I think that just that interest in always wanting to learn that also is a big part of conveying your passion. And if I can just add one more thought, because Nimra just made me think of something. Um, I recently did an interview with someone and I think they asked a really great question, which was like, what can I do to really be the best that I could be in this role? Like, what does this role need? Because yes, we were talking about their skills, the whole interview and, you know, how it aligned with their future career aspirations. But I think just asking, like, what is your team missing currently? Like, you know, what 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 can I build upon? How can I fit in is really great. Um, and along those lines, I think having questions prepared when you're in, an, you're in an interview is just so important. And that also kind of conveys passion to me, because if someone says they don't have any questions, I'm like, how could you not have questions? <laughs> you know, um, all of that is great advice. Thank you all. I'm going to jump into some of the questions that we got from the attendees. Um, one is about undergraduate degrees. So many students worry about needing clinical training, um, specifically an RN, for example, uh, to work in a hospital setting. What advice can you give these students to find positions appropriate for having a public health training? Anyone like to start with an answer or have an answer? Um, I could, I can probably provide some insight on this. So I, I have a bachelor's in public health and I did work for some time uh, after my bachelor's before starting my master's. I think um, in terms of getting clinical training, um, I was just very focused on getting any entry level position I could in a hospital because I knew that I was lacking that clinical background. So. Um, you know, I was really looking, my first job was a research technician role. So I was working directly with patients and gaining clinical experience that way. So I, I think that um, not having clinical experience at the time, it wasn't such a big disadvantage, but I did have a big learning curve. I also think it's valuable to try and find volunteer opportunities within a hospital or internship or shadowing opportunities as well, because those can really help you gain insight. Madison or Mary, anything to add? Um, so one of my roles actually at Stanford um, after performance improvement was overseeing our volunteer resources program. Um, and so we did get a lot of inquiries from students who wanted to, to volunteer. Um, and I would say just because of demand, um, it, we usually work with um, school programs that already have students to then do clinical rotations, like especially if it's a nursing degree. Um, we, um, and we kind of stuck to that because um, we've already established these relationships with these programs and they needed a percentage number, you know, hours of clinical time. Um, in terms of other volunteer requests, I actually found that we were more likely to accept requests from students who want to volunteer if they've already connected with the department. So I would say reach out to what primary care, population health, prim, uh, palliative medicine, like find the department that you think performance improvement um, and say, I just want to offer time to volunteer. I'm happy to onboard as a volunteer, which is, by the way, a, a big process in itself. Um, but I think if you're willing to spend time, there might be remote opportunities to volunteer now um, with the pandemic. Um, but going directly to volunteer resources is probably not the best idea. You want to first establish a relationship and then find a need with the department first who can then advocate for you to be onboarded. Excellent. Um, Madison, unless you have something to add. No, I think we're great. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask a question that's in Q&A. That's a general question. And Mary, you mentioned population health and we have it in the title today. And the basic question, which apologies on my part, we should have probably covered a little more detail. Is there any actual difference between saying population health and public health? Would any of the professionals in the room like to take that on? I'm happy to, to take that on as, as best as I can. Um, to me, population health is a very specific component of the broader public health picture. To me, population health is associated more with primary care. Um, when I think of population health and how it's defined, there's, say you're trying to move the dot on outcomes for patients with diabetes and there's certain metrics that 
um, the clinics are trying to improve. Like, has every patient with um, been screened for the HbA1c? Have they had their foot screenings? And those are things that we track in a registry by patient to make sure that those outcomes are being done, which then probably get publicly reported and there's probably reimbursement associated with that for the hospital. Um, so when I'm thinking population health, I'm very think I'm thinking specifically at that patient care level and also kind of what the um, the healthcare organization is doing to influence those metrics. While public health, as we all know, is much more broader than that. Um, um, even in a public health setting, you're talking about infection control, you're talking about um, access to care, um, health equity, much bigger picture than population health, which is I think more focused on the patient care component for chronic, chronic diseases. Great answer. Anyone else have any other angle about population versus public health? There's a question and I'm not sure who wants to answer this. Anyone who has any insights, it is welcome about all the short certificates. It's kind of a hot thing. You can get some short certificates, whether on LinkedIn or different programs online. Are there any that are actually beneficial for hiring? You know, if I'm an undergraduate, should I be trying to get some additional certificates to land a job within a hospital system? Um, I can... I can vouch for the certificate that I have, which is the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt um, in Quality Improvement. That was a certificate that I obtained actually as part of my master's because I did a practicum in QI and I found that I actually really enjoyed the QI process. Um, I don't recommend just getting certificates for the sake of getting certificates. And I do not recommend getting certificates just to kind of add letters to your name. Um, I, I know a lot of people are doing that. And I, I, I know people who do that. And I feel like that might not be the best approach. If you have in a niche in healthcare that you're passionate about and that you're interested in, you know, definitely get that certificate that you can apply and actually utilize. But I, I don't, really recommend just getting certificates because they seem like a good fit. Um, I, I, I'm interested to know what, um, what Mary and what um, Madison would have to say on this topic as well. No, I, I totally agree. Um, I think definitely there's value to certificates, um, and, but I think they have their time and their place. I wouldn't, personally, I, I think I would look more for experience, work experience, um, even experiences through your school. So like if you're in a master's program and you're doing a practicum, um, that feels more valuable to me personally um, than just saying you have a certificate, but then maybe like really lacking in experience. That being said, I do think certificates can be valuable. Um, I think sometimes it's helpful just to look up people that have a similar job title that you're trying to get and see what do they have. I look on LinkedIn all the time um, to see the kind of things that people have um, for their education and what kind of jobs they get as a result of it. And I feel like that's pretty helpful too, because certificates, of course, cost time and money. And I don't think it's an, a good investment unless you know that, yes, this is going to help me get to this exact, the specific job that I want. If it is, then like, great, absolutely do it. But um, there's not one that I can necessarily think of off the top of my head that's like, oh, yes, if someone has that, they're a shoe in. Um, so I think that's just maybe something to think about. Yeah, I, I would say I've never hired. I don't, I'm not even sure if I've looked at certificates, to be honest, when, I, when we hire, because it's, it's the job, it's the, it's your skill set. Um, and also something to note, um, I know a lot of people here are candidates for, for master's in public health. A lot of uh, manager positions will just ask for any master's degree. So it could be MPH, MBA. There's no specification on, on which master. So I don't think that, um, that, and that just shows how much it really is more important on your experience. Um, and kind of going back to the passion question, if you're, you're spending time kind of thinking about what you feel you should be getting, then you're not spending time with where your passion is, which is really going to be what gets you to the job that you want and, um, is best suited for at the end of the day. So I think investing time in, in doing those things, even if, um, it's volunteering, even if it's not about the pay that will get you, 
further at the end of the day than accumulating certifications where you're not sure if it's going to really lead you to where you want to be. I think certifications are great if you're already in the job and people around you are getting certifications together, which is going to be part of something that your employee will offer for you. Then that's relevant. It's timely. That, that is the best sort of certificate for what you're doing versus thinking in advance what certificate I should be getting. Great, thank you. So here's a question um, that I think all of you can help in responding to. What's the best method of finding open physicians in healthcare? Who would like to start? Um, I'm happy to, to start. Um, for Stanford Healthcare, and, and I'm sure most um, uh, organizations, they have a career page. Um, you would just search Stanford Healthcare careers, for example, and be able to see uh, what jobs are available. Um, there is a way to sort by what I would re uh, recommend is um, professional um, slash administrative roles. Um, and that's where you would get, I think, the ones that are applicable to the, the people uh, who are here today. Nimra, Madison, anything to add? Um, pretty similar. Baylor's setup is also where you can filter out for administrative professional jobs. One thing I would add, though, is that for when specifically with Baylor's careers portal, if they are asking for a certain number of years of experience, they are pretty strict about that. Like be very distinctive in your resume that you have whatever the required years of experience is. If it's through internships, if it's through projects, whatever it may be, but it needs to be very clear that you meet that requirement because that will be like an automatic disqualification if you don't have those years. Good to know. And Madison, anything else on job searching? I, you know, I think the career page is, is probably your best bet. Um, my graduate program had a really great list serve, which of course was not just limited to hospitals. Um, but those could be included as well. So I would say um, definitely look at your universities and what listservs they have for jobs, um, because I've always found those to be very, very helpful and, and people post to those all the time. Um, so I think that's also a great resource. And thank you for that shout out for career services there. I'm glad someone mentioned it. Um, yes, definitely use regardless of what level of program you're in, your career services and your school and your alumni. Um, I'm also going to add to it, there is, whether you call them hidden job market or just jobs you weren't aware of, it's usually a two to one type of thing. It can be up to 70% of jobs have gotten due to referrals, not because of responding to job lists. So grow your network, your professional community would be my advice as well on that. <laughs> Katie, there's um, one thing I can also add in regards to job search. Um, so there are times where the, uh, the um, job description will mention like the certain degree is recommended or something is recommended. Uh, I wouldn't let that discourage you if you don't have what is recommended um, because it's not a requirement. Um, I think a lot of people stop there. Like I've seen a lot of positions where it says nursing degree recommended. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't feel like that now I'm um, eligible. But actually, I, I've seen a lot of MPH um, graduates be in those roles that originally had been uh, filled by clinical people. So it's really nice to see that evolution and know that um, that is not a hard stop. Um, and um, to numerous way, I think there are times where, you know, timing is everything. Sometimes you may be one of the few pools of people and a hiring manager, depending on how quickly they need to fill the position they may need to consider someone with slightly less experience. That's what's on the, the, um, the portal. So just something to keep in mind. Um, definitely note it if you meet the level of experience, but if you don't fill it in with why you have the passion and why you have the relevant skill sets. Excellent advice. Recommended truly is that. <laughs> it is not required or preferred, I mean. Um, another question. So from an undergrad, what kinds of opportunities can I benefit from during my undergraduate program? What can I do to set myself up for success when job searching? Anyone have some ideas on that? I mean, for me personally, when I was an undergrad, I did psychology and neuroscience. Um, I actually didn't even know what public health was until I graduated and started working in it and realized that's what I was doing. Um, 
but I was in a psychology research lab and that did so much for me. It really opened a lot of doors. It's how I got my first job out of um, undergrad. It taught me basic research skills. It taught me what research even was and what it kind of could look like, at least for social sciences. Um, so I think if you're interested in research, that is a is a great thing to do while you're an undergrad. And every university seems to have so many different research opportunities um, that you can really take advantage of. Um, yeah, so that's what I would personally recommend. Um, to add to that, um, during my undergrad, I was a uh, I was a public health and Spanish major. So I actually was a member of our university's public health organization, which was a great opportunity to connect with other students and get to know about different public health professionals and just to kind of educate myself a bit about the different public health opportunities. I also think talking to my professors was really valuable, um, just asking them about their professional experiences and whatever guidance they had to offer. Um, that, was, that was a great opportunity for me to just learn more about public health career opportunities. Great. Question here, um, actually I have two questions I think we'll have time for. We may have time for a third, we're getting close to the end and we have a ton that we didn't get to, so I apologize. Um, we just don't have the time. But why would, why did you, I guess, for each of you individually choose hospital systems instead of working at a public sector or government health department when you graduated? I guess I can go first. Um, so I actually did work for the University of North Carolina um, right when I graduated. I worked for their Center for Health Equity Research. Um, and I've also done a little bit of contract work um, for the Department of Public Health in the state that I was in at the time. Um, so I have had a little bit of mixed experiences, I guess. And I think what's really great about working in a hospital, at least again, for me, I'm coming from a research specific perspective, um, but there's a lot of variety in our day-to-day. -day. Uh, for us, we're recruiting out of the hospital. So, I mean, that means we can be on inpatient, outpatient. We have an office space. We have visit space to do our data collections. And so it's just a lot of patient interaction, which is really great. Um, and another thing that I think is important for, for me I'm, as someone participating, um, you know, working in research, that's about health equity um, and reducing disparities, it's important to know what healthcare systems even look like. And I think working within one gives you a lot of knowledge. Um, and it's just a, in that way, it's very informative about even the work that you're doing, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I think hospitals offer a lot of variety. I, it, they're also a great space to network. I've learned about so many different departments and research centers just within Brigham. Um, and that's really cool to, to just kind of know what's going on and what even all the options there are for me, you know, maybe if I want to transition after this role into something else, I mean, you can stay at the hospital and, and there's just so many opportunities. So I think that's, what's really exciting about it um, to me. Great. It's great that you have the experience over all the different sectors to help people see the differences. Mary or Nimra, any? added comments to why a hospital system? Um, I think when I was in a research assistant, when I was um, first out of school, I, I found that we were working a lot with clinics um, as part of our study. And, and I just felt like, wow, like this is great. And I'm, I'm learning a lot of great skills, but I still felt like two steps removed from the patient and the patient care. And I, um, uh, so to me, even once I started working in hospitals, like quality was great, performance improvement was great, but you're still a supporting department for a clinical <laughs> department. Um, and so that's why I think after that Pell, those Pell moves and, and getting the experience to kind of make up for the fact that I didn't have clinical skills, um, that gave me the opportunity to be in operations as a manager because I was a manager in a patient experience department. Um, before I was one in operation. So I think that was really what was pivotal to give me manager experience because otherwise on a clinical team is really just the manager mostly who is non-clinical. Um, and, and just what Nimmer was saying, I actually think um, uh, lean background was very helpful for me from my performance improvement um, days, but also as a manager is very key to kind of the work that I do day to day. 
Um, Great. To add to that, oh, uh, just just to say that I've always been really fascinated by the business side of healthcare, and I think that was my motivation to go into a hospital system. Um, similar to what both Mary and Madison said, just the the various opportunities, and there's there's just so much to be learned in the different departments, and I think that's what really drew me into working for a hospital system as well. Excellent. So I'm going to end with this question, which I just saw and I love it. Changed where I was going. Can an MPH, so a person with a master's in public health, aspire to be a CEO of a hospital system? I think so. I think so. And in fact, I feel like that's what ACHE is, is really um, a supportive program for. No, I will never want to be a CEO and my hat's off to people in that role. Um, but I, that's why at the end of the day, I don't think it matters. Yes, most CEOs have an MBA degree. Some of them have, um, you know, MD degrees. Um, but to me, um, when I see the progression of people who have administrative roles in at Stanford Healthcare, um, the again the masters didn't matter. It was really their passion and you know what what experience they took to to get there. Um, and so I, I do believe uh, someone in MPH could be a CEO. Okay, and yeah. you do have a link to that organization in chat for people who are looking to ACHE, right? Anyone else? on CE becoming the head of a hospital. I was just going to add that I think um, an MPH just as a degree has a lot of utility and can be applied in a lot of different ways. So I, I agree with Mary. I think a lot of it has to do with your experience and your passion and your kind of progression over the course of your career. Um, but I, I do think an, an MPH equips you with so many great tools. Um, and like I said, is I think just very applicable um, to a lot of different roles and within a hospital, so. Excellent. So I'm going to give each of you a chance for one parting word of advice that you want to share with anyone. If you forget enough, if you forget everything else, please remember what would be the one thing. And Madison, since you're on the screen, let's start with you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure. Yeah, the pressure. Um, I would say I think, and this is something I've personally struggled with too as a young professional, um, just don't be afraid to, to go for things that, that are important to you and that you're interested by. And, and you just really don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And now that I'm a manager participating in the hiring process, I, I do see so many times where it's like, wow, we really do have a lot of great candidates. And unfortunately we do just have to pick one or uh, unfortunately our timelines aren't gonna match up perfectly. Or like, there's like all sorts of reasons why people do and don't get jobs. And I think it's really easy to get discouraged in the job hunt. Um, so I would say, you know, as someone who's now seeing kind of the other side of things, um, just really go for the, the things that you're interested in um, and passionate about. And I do think that shines through. And do your best to just really communicate that with people throughout the hiring process. And I think that will, will get you a long way. Excellent. Nimra, we'll call on you next. Um, I definitely would reiterate the point of not getting discouraged to all my early careers out there. Um, you know, I think I five years ago, if you'd asked me what I'd been doing, what I was going to be doing, I'm the work I'm doing now is really different than what I thought I was going to be. I applied for administrative fellowships that didn't work out when I was doing my MPH. And, you know, yes, it was a setback, but I, I realized that every opportunity that you take on um, is an opportunity to learn. So, you know, be ready to accept the rejection, be ready to face those job opportunities that don't work out, but just know that as long as you're passionate about learning and as long as you are just, you keep yourself relevant and keep networking with everyone and marketing yourself as best as you can, you will find the right opportunity, even if your plan A doesn't necessarily work out. Great. And Mary, in one minute or less, parting words. Take advantage of every opportunity as a learning opportunity. Um, there's going to be times where maybe you apply for three jobs and you didn't get your first two choices and that's okay. There's also going to be times where you know, 10 years down the line, you are going to be asked to take on add a whole department under you because of staffing or downsizing. And I think for a lot of people, that's discouraging. 
But remember, that's a learning opportunity and that's going to help set you up for something bigger and better down the road. So take those um, as as a, you know, with optimism and how it's going to help lead to your growth. Perfect. It just turned two o'clock on the dot as you finish that. Thank you so much, Mary, Nimra, and Madison. I hope our attendees got as much out of this as I am sure they did. And there is a recording. I'm pretty sure Nick has put it in the chat. So feel free to um, check out the recording and share with friends. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you everyone.